All right, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show with me today, we have a special guest, Jennifer Beck. Jennifer is a seasoned entrepreneur with deep experience in the emerging legal cannabis and hemp market. Her technology company, Cannabase, was founded in 2013 as the first and largest online wholesale marketplace connecting the legal cannabis market. During her time with Cannabase, she served for two years as the vice chair of the Colorado Cannabis Chamber of Commerce and was involved with advocacy for responsible legalization. After selling Cannabase in 2016, Jennifer co-founded GHE, if I'm pronouncing that right, nice, uh, yeah. <laughs> with a mission to help high-performing people sleep better, recover faster, and rejuvenate from the inside out. Jihee's proprietary, clean, and highly functional CBD skin and body care was founded on the idea of self-centered wellness, coming within to find our authenticity, our joy, and our power and compassion for ourselves in the earth. Jennifer has been featured on Bloomberg Radio, Forbes, Green Entrepreneur, Marijuana Business Daily, and more. Jennifer, really happy to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Absolutely. So I wanted to hear kind of uh, what was your first introduction or like why did you decide that you wanted to get into uh, uh, cannabis in terms of with business? Like what, what initially drew you to that market? Oh, that's such a fun question. Um, so it was back in 2013. I've always been an entrepreneur. I was in tech, so I was an online marketing director for several startups in the Denver area. And my husband was a web developer, so he's a programmer. And one of my oldest, closest friends was an early dispensary owner, so back when it was all medical. And he owned a dispensary called Doctor's Orders. And we got together for dinner, and I was just really curious about the market. It was everywhere in you know, Denver news, was legalization and, and the licenses coming out. And I asked him what the opportunities were um, technology-wise for the emerging cannabis industry. And there was something really interesting that was about to happen, which is that up until this point, our market had been, well, REC had just passed. That's important. Uh, 2013, REC had just passed. And, but the market was initially vertically integrated. So if you wanted to sell in a dispensary, you had to have your own grow. And there was this small allotment, like 30% for wholesale. So companies could sell between each other a little bit of leftover or if they wanted to mix up their strains, but you were responsible for, for providing the bulk of your own product. This vertical integration mandate was set to end in about nine months. And so companies for the first time could have decoupled licenses. They could have just a cultivation or just a, a retail dispensary. And there was no framework for how they were connecting. And so um, what they were doing for wholesale is it was like drug dealing. You would call, be like, man, I got the best shit. Here's what, it, excuse me, I don't know if I to watch my language. Um, here's what it's supposed to, here's what it costs and, and you're going to love it. And it's, it's such dank bud. I mean, it was literally like, you know, just marijuana dealers. And we knew that there was going to be a future for wholesale that needed to be much more transparent, <laughs> much more um, compliant. And so we started the first wholesale marketplace um, based on allowing these licensed businesses to create accounts and in a really transparent, safe way, share lab data and have some idea of supply and demand with which listings were getting more connections and views. And, um, and we started to really build up the, the legal wholesale marketplace. Awesome. So if I'm understanding correctly, so when you talk about like the vertical integration, so was it that a company had to both produce the cannabis along with sell it like at the dispensary, like it had to be all in, they, they had to do everything basically. Yeah, and every, this, every operation had to be vertically integrated. So they had to have both licenses, a grow and a dispensary, and they had to grow 70% at least. I think it was 70-30. It's been a while since I thought about that, but I think it was 70-30 um, of their own product had to be sold. So there was this huge barrier to entry in terms of cost. And you think about that business model, you know, there are, there are some really big companies that are equipped to manage both retail you know, in, in manufacturing and, and growing and being farmers. But for most people, those are different businesses. And so it was really the beginning of marijuana, you know, the, the cannabis world as we knew it when, when that licensing became decoupled and we started seeing that specialization. 
And tell me about like what, what you experienced kind of being on the front lines of that. Like what, was it sort of just a, a free for all at the beginning or what, what ended up happening? Oh, beyond. It was beyond a free for all. It was so wild. Um, so there's lots of things because cannabis isn't recognized or, you know, the laws were only on a state level. They weren't on a federal level. You've got all sorts of issues that you read about, you skim over it. But when you're living it, I mean, it, it can be existential at times. So, you know, lack of access to banking it took mo- a couple months. And the next thing you know, we got a bunch of letters from JP Morgan. Your personal checking's closed. Your credit cards are closed. Your savings are closed. We lost so many bank accounts. We lost, lost five, six bank accounts. Um, so that's, of course, a huge issue. One of our, um, we early, early on made some people angry in the industry because so we were like this first centralized wholesale marketplace and we had data for, you know, about how, what pricings were going for, um, how prices were fluctuating. Well, before us, all those prices were self-reported. And so people were reporting, you know, lower costs than products were actually going for. And so we started creating more data transparency that made people unhappy for a lot of reasons, you know. And um, another one that hit us big time was because we didn't have protection from the federal government, we didn't have IP protection on a national level. And so someone really early on, um, we had first use in commerce for our name, but we were a state by state marketplace because that's how you can't sell across state lines. And somebody came in and started using our name. They basically created a dummy site in other states and then came to us and said, we sent them a cease and desist. Hey, you know, we're cannabis. We've been here for a while. And they really knew what they were doing. And they lawyered up and they said, oh, well, you can have your name in these three states, but it's going to cost, you know, $100,000 and I want 50% of the company. And they, you know, they lawyered up, they took it really far. So those were huge lessons about some of the protections of the federal government that we um, take for granted. And that was why I got involved with the chamber, the Colorado Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. I was the only ancillary business on the board. Everyone else was a licensed cannabis business. So a lot of edibles companies, um, growers and retailers, but I represented the ancillary side, the services that support the licensed businesses, because even though we are not licensed and we're not dealing with all, we weren't dealing with all the limitations they were, um, the lack of federal support, lack of safe banking, greatly impacted our business. What is like, when you take a look at like the the cannabis industry today versus back then, I mean, it's still federally illegal, but there's been lots of, obviously, I guess it probably varies. It definitely does vary state to state, but is there, is it less of a kind of barriers to entry nowadays? Um, Or like how have things changed basically from then to now? Not as much as you would think, like really not very much. (laughs) We really haven't had much reform. We kept thinking it was right around the corner. It was right around the corner and it really wasn't. It's actually, so we're speaking right now about, you know, licensed cannabis businesses, companies that are plant touching um, with cannabis, which is separate from my business now, which is CBD um, and is illegal under the 2018 Farm Bill. I still deal with some of these issues, but not all of them. So I do want to clarify that. But in terms of the licensed cannabis market, um, we haven't really had a lot of meaningful reform. And it's actually very, very challenging for licensed businesses to become profitable. And that's something that not a lot of people realize. They think that pot companies are rich and actually very, very few of them are. There's a lot of, um, a lot of devastation in, in the marijuana community. A lot of people really, it's very hard to survive. Um, you have limitations on advertising. The biggest thing is lack of access to banking and financial institutions. I mean, you you can't get capital. So the best financed companies are the ones that go public, especially on the Canadian exchanges. And those kind of, those, those stocks become piggy banks. And, um, I like the marijuana pot stocks. I've been in those for a long time, but you do have to be really careful because they are piggy banks and they have to be, they're just kind of the only source of capital a really huge issue that affects licensed cannabis businesses across the country is a law called 280E. And 280E is a a remnant of the war on drugs that basically says, if you're selling, your product is federally illegal that you are selling, you can't deduct your business expenses from your taxes. And um, the IRS is really enforces this and 
um, really audits cannabis companies to make sure that they're not deducting these expenses. And so between 280E, lack of debt and access to institutional capital, you know, still not many investment groups want to touch it. There are groups that do, but it's, it's much more challenging. Um, so you get a lot of toxic financing and the insane expenses that go along with having a license and running a compliant business. I mean, don't even get me started on, on what it takes to run a compliant marijuana business. It's very, very challenging for it to work. Um, and then that trickles down to the ancillary side of the industry, the, the businesses that support the cannabis companies, um, and then work to make them more efficient or, or uh, more compliant. It's challenging to do that when they don't have you know, much profit to work with. Do you think we're ever going to see like, you know, say the Bud Light or, you know, like in terms of a big, like big cannabis companies that will be kind of nationwide, worldwide, like we don't really see that right now, but is that going to happen? Do you see that ever happening? Yeah. Um, at, at the rate that it's going, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, you know, they're trying to do things to encourage diversity within the industry, like giving licenses to underprivileged, you know, populations and, and people that might not otherwise have access, but really all of those initiatives fall flat without access to banking. Access to banking is really number one because you can get all the licenses in the world, but then if you can't get a loan, you know, most people don't have the cash to just start a business, um, especially a business that's that cash intensive. So the industry is increasingly getting run by these large MSOs, these multi-state operators that are getting financed from publicly traded vehicles. And um, although it's still a state-by-state -state business, they have operations in lots of states and they're able to grow their horsepower largely through you know, mergers and acquisitions. There's so much consolidation because of these hardships um, and because people need to consolidate resources and then the stock can be used you know, as a form of capital to buy young companies. And so consolidation is rapid, a um, lot of mergers and acquisitions, and um, yeah, financing is kind of limited to still a lot of the, a lot of the rich old white guys. Got it. So talk to me about, so you, you transition more into like hemp-based CBD, if that's okay. So talk to me about, yeah, what, what was the idea behind, uh, behind GE? And uh, yeah, just tell me about like what, what kind of products that you guys sell? Yeah, so we sold Cannabase in 2016 and kind of one of these roll-up deals, a company that was becoming a bigger and bigger technology provider. And um, that was a fantastic road for Cannabase to go down. And after that, I actually had a baby. And so I left and um, was just a mom for, for about a year or two and was really thinking about what I wanted to do next and love the plant you know, have such deep respect for the plant and am so excited about the science around cannabinoids and what these products can do for you. But to me, there was a gap in CBD products, I'd say for a more mature market. Um, CBD becomes more and more valuable in a way as you get older. It really helps with a lot of the side effects of aging. It helps with topically fine lines and wrinkles and, and our appearance in the dermis and, and staying healthy. It helps speed muscle recovery. It helps our bodies feel better. It helps um, restore our, our circadian rhythm, our sleep, our sleep-wake cycles. And these are all things that kind of get more challenging as we get into, you know, our late 30s, 40s, 50s, and then as you move into, you know, menopause and stuff. And uh, the majority still of CBD consumers are in their early 20s. They're people that are comfortable with cannabis and are excited about trying products that are related. And I believe that a lot of the stuff that's out there is marketed to that consumer. It's, you know, it's millennial um, and it's, it's young. The other thing that we noticed because we were so involved in the supply chain side was that the majority of products coming into the CBD industry were created by like the same couple manufacturers. I mean, like, I'm, this is a made up number, but in my experience, like maybe 90% of what we saw out there was coming from a few big CBD manufacturers that were creating just vats of stuff, like vat of lotion. And then you can, it's called white labeling. You can put your label on that vat of lotion. And so although the market is flooded, it's not as innovative or diverse as you'd expect. There are some very cool indie brands that are doing really innovative things, of course, but a lot of it is kind of a race to the bottom in terms of how much CBD can you pump in and then how low can you make that price and how many gas stations can you get it into. And for me, that was 
um, an opportunity to create something a little bit more beautiful, more high-end, more synergistic. Um, as a woman, I've always enjoyed high-end skincare. I enjoy, you know, nice products, using nice products, the experience of nice products. And CBD works when you use it over time. It is not like taking an NyQuil. You don't take one, you don't take CBD, sleep hard, and then move on with your life. It's something that builds up in your system. And um, that's where you really begin to see the results. So to me, there was a way to, an opportunity to create something that might appeal to a more mature, sophisticated audience, um, more discerning audience, especially something that might be more trustworthy for people as they're starting to get older, but really dealing with real aches and pains and really dealing with some of these issues, making something incredibly trustworthy and compliant. Um, and yeah, I was gonna say one more thing, but I can't remember. Um, so yeah, making something more mature and something that you would love to use so much that that habit would be natural. It would be, it would be habitual, it'd be addictive. So you would actually really experience those benefits of CBD and not say, I got a lotion, didn't work. And that was our vision with, with moving into the CBD space. So what, tell me about like what happens when you put CBD on the skin? That is such a great question. So um, do you want to talk about the endocannabinoid system for a moment? Yeah, I'd love to. So the endocannabinoid system is, you know, a network of cannabinoid receptors. Endocannabinoids are the cannabinoids that are um, natural to our bodies, naturally found in our bodies. And the endocannabinoid network is receptors for those endocannabinoids found in almost every major organ of the body. And there's two main types of receptors that we've identified so far, CB1 and CB2. So CB1 is found largely in our central nervous system in our brain. And it, uh, so the whole endocannabinoid system is geared around homeostasis and balance, helping different systems maintain their balance. It's a great way to look at it. And um, the CB1 receptors are largely in the central nervous system and are related to mood, memory, um, sleep-wake cycle, appetite regulation, all those deeper, deeper uh, balancing elements. There are also some CB1 receptors related to pain in our peripheral nervous system, the interpretation and the pain signals that get sent to our brain. And then you have CB2. CB2 receptors are largely in the peripheral nervous system and found in the dermis of the skin, and they are located in immune cells. Um, so they're, they're associated with our immune response. And that's why CBD can be so helpful with inflammation. They help reduce inflammation when those immune cells are getting activated and stimulated. So whether you take, so the different methods of delivery are really important. If you're vaping or you're um, taking an oral tincture, it's more likely to move into your bloodstream. There's higher bioavailability and that's gonna impact more those CB1 receptors in our brain and in our central nervous system, helping with those regulating processes. This has given many people the impression that topical um, or skincare CBD is stupid or, or it's a fad because it's not ending up in our bloodstream. That's not true at all. There's a whole layer of the endocannabinoid network that's in the dermis of the skin. So this brings us to your question, what happens when you put CBD on your skin? Um, these CB2 receptors in our skin and some CB1, so the CB1s are related to pain, the feelings of pain, the sensation of pain, and CB2 is related to um, maintaining balance in the skin, like it regulates oil production, increases skin cell turnover, um, reduces inflammation. A lot of common skin conditions are the result of, are the symptoms of an inflammatory response, whether it's acne or eczema or priasis. So by applying topical CBD, no, it's not moving into our bloodstream and it's not going to help you sleep at night, but it is powerful if you're dealing with acne, if you're dealing with that inflammation, you're dealing with increasing the skin cell turnover and, and that oil regulation. Um, now, of course, this is anything I'm saying is not a medical claim. This is largely, it's anecdotal, it's early evidence. The FDA has not placed their blessing on CBD and we don't have these formal peer reviewed studies that we really need to understand these processes better. But this is what early studies are indicating and is so um, encouraging when we see anecdotal evidence of people coming back and saying like, oh my God, my skin looks the best it's ever looked, thank you. It really, these are powerful powerful mechanisms. So what, what differentiates like the CBD that you guys are using um, from the CBD that you were talking about that kind of just comes wholesale and you just slap a like white label on it or whatever? Um, like what, what differentiates like what your company is doing? That's a great question. 
Um, so first of all, of course, we have sourced the highest quality American grown USC because this is not oversaw by the FDA. You don't know what you're getting in a CBD product. And there's a lot that can help. If it's not um, American grown, you can see pesticides, residual solvents. It can get, it can get kind of nasty. So the first thing is using the highest grade American grown hemp, um, professionally extracted. Everything that we do is done in a high quality manufacturing facility, ISO certified, et cetera. So that's an important piece. Um, from the other companies that are also using high grade American grown lab tested CBD, I'd say the main difference is in our formulations. Uh, we our, our products, the goal with our products is that we wanted them to stand the test of time. Even if somebody came out and said, oh my gosh, everything is wrong. CBD is nothing. CBD doesn't work. Then would we, we don't just have a bunch of CBD products. Now, obviously I don't even believe there's a chance that's going to happen, but um, for instance, our serum. Our serum is a high end hyaluronic acid, vitamins B3 and C with incredible essential oils, hemp seed oil, rosehip oil, camellia seed oil. It's a serum that I would buy at the price we sell it for, even without CBD. It's a phenomenal serum. Um, that's why it's being used by spas and acupuncturists and people who have been interested in the CBD fad, but they're not going to put something, you know, uh, comedogenic, something that's going to clog pores or, or low quality on a client at the end of a facial. So, same thing with our with our balm and with our with our tincture. So our sleep tincture, we complement the CBD with fast acting herbs and melatonin because even though the CBD takes time to build up in your system and really create that balance in the sleep wake cycle, you're going to experience immediate results with our sleep tincture because we've added these supportive herbs and the melatonin and we've given it a great flavor and it's clear and it's not syrupy and it's a fantastic experience. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, as far as there's so many other like ingredients too that it makes sense not to just isolate CBD when you're doing something like this. So yeah, I, I really like the idea behind that. Thank you. Yeah. And it really amplifies the immediate results. Like our serum would work without the CBD. It's going to moisturize your skin. It's going to clear it. It's going to make it stronger. Um, same thing with our sleep tincture and our body balm. They're all really effective without the CBD. And so you, you will love using them and you'll become addicted to using them. And then as you do, now you're nourishing these multiple layers of the endocannabinoid system. And then that's why we say it's restoring wellness from the inside out. And all of a sudden you're kind of, you feel yourself transform. It's an amazing solution. So I know that, uh, your company doesn't specifically deal with, with THC, but can you tell me as far as THC topically, does it work? Does it not work? What's your, what's your opinion on putting like, cause there's a lot of like products like for pain and I see at dispensaries, you know, that, that have, sometimes it's like one-to-one -one THC to CBD. Sometimes it's just THC. Sometimes it's just CBD. What, what's your take on that? I actually don't know how THC like interacts with the CB2 cells in the dermis. I'm sure that's, so THC um, does interact directly with um, endocannabinoid receptors. CBD does not. CBD actually um, helps your body increase its supply of natural endocannabinoids by decreasing their degradation and um, keeping them from prohibiting the reuptake. And also it helps balance, it helps the receptors become less likely to be overstimulated or understimulated. So it helps regulate the receptors and it helps increase the natural amount of cannabinoids in your system. It's not actually directly binding to the receptor itself versus THC does. So I'm not sure how THC in the skin, if that would like create a high, probably. A lot of times when we do see THC on topical products, you see them on patches, like a transdermal patch. So you've got oral and you've got topical and kind of in the middle is this concept of transdermal. And a lot of times transdermal is a patch. Um, Mary's Medicinals was really early in this. And a patch, you usually put somewhere really venous, like, um, you know, on your wrist or like on your hip. And it can sit for like six to eight hours and it's going to be absorbed into the bloodstream. So now you're looking at that higher bioavailability, but on a topical level. And in that case, THC will work just the same as it would work if you were to ingest it um, in any other way. And it'd probably be more efficacious than an edible where it needs to move through the digestive system. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, what would you, what would you say as far as like when you look at kind of the cannabis market today, being having been involved with, with 
with it in different ways. Like what, what sort of opportunities do you see for, for other entrepreneurs right now who are looking to get involved in the cannabis space? Like what, what do you see as the most promising different avenues? So I'm a huge believer um, with the, in terms of the licensed cannabis market, I'm a huge believer in the ancillary space. I think the ancillary space isn't um, always tapped into as much as it should be. Uh, cannabis businesses have such unique needs. They have such unique advertising restrictions, such unique financial needs, like everything about a cannabis business tends to be unique. And so there is a, a lot of space for specialists who want to come in and support and optimize cannabis businesses. And that's um, a really good opportunity. I also think that there's, <laughs> nobody wants to hear this, but there is a lot of room in sales. So there's a lot of brands, there's a lot of really good products out there. Um, but selling CBD um, or being a bud tender, but especially like on the CBD side, you can't advertise. You have the same advertising restrictions as cannabis businesses. And it takes a lot of communication often to sell because people are nervous. They still think, is this going to get me high? Is this pot? Is it legal? Ugh. But there's so much CBD out there that there is this wall up for advertising. It's like, I saw another CBD brand, I don't care. So when you have both the education problem and the advertising issue, you really have an opportunity for drug sales. And like, I know we offer, we bring on brand ambassadors that we pay a commission for anything they sell. And it's far more generous than anything I would have ever pictured paying. I mean, it's a lot of cash right off the top. We're willing to pay for people bringing new customers because we have these advertising restrictions. We have this money to spend for that. So one way, if you're like, I want to learn the industry and I want to get in, I want to make some money, um, you know, visit, visit us at GE, visit companies that have products that you think are interesting and just think about marketing, sales, distribution. There's a lot of space there. Um, but if you're looking to start your own business, I would say becoming a specialist to help with the unique needs of, of cannabis and CBD businesses. There's always space there. Anything that related to, to CBD, hemp, cannabis, anything that we haven't covered yet that you think is important for the listeners? Yeah, I think it's important if you're new to the space to know that, you know, I keep referencing licensed cannabis businesses versus CBD. They are different. Um, CBD is non-psychoactive and the CBD that you see commercially available outside of dispensaries is cultivated from hemp plant. Um, hemp is a strain of cannabis, but it's grown with very, very, very low THC levels and was made legal by the 2018 Farm Bill. So that's why we see the proliferation of CBD businesses over the last couple of years. So those are completely legal to buy and um, are non-psychoactive. And if anyone you buy from should have, you know, a certificate of analysis, you want to make sure it's a trustworthy company and you want to stick with it for 30 days. You want to give it time. Uh, separately, if you are interested in cannabis, you want to buy from a licensed dispensary, um, and that's you know, legal on a state-by-state -state basis. Do you have, uh, just, just not, maybe not specifically with the with topical CBD, but when it comes to, uh, you know, people looking, uh, looking at CBD to take, you know, whether it be in an edible or a tincture or whatnot, um, when it comes to hemp-derived CBD versus like cannabis derived CBD. I know like there's, there's kind of a lot of confusion. I mean, I, I actually am kind of confused with the, the distinction between the two. Um, is it, is it just that like, because of the farm bill, the hemp derived CBD has to be under that certain level? Yeah. So the hemp derived CBD, um, it, it kind of depends how, how you're getting the CBD and a lot of products, it's going to be broad or full spectrum, in which case they pulled, they've extracted all the cannabinoids out of the plant, as well as THC, um, flavonoids, terpenes, essential oils, other elements, which we don't know if they have a synergistic effect with improving the efficacy of CBD. And so some people think, you know, some of the efficacy of CBD might come from using it with THC or using it with the other cannabinoids. And that's why if you have access to like a licensed dispensary, you could be interested in trying some of their one-to-one -one products. That gives you an idea of how CBD is working in your system with these other with these other cannabinoids. And um, it's all kind of experimentation, but a lot of people, especially people dealing with pain. I mean, we know that CBD on its own is fantastic, but CBD with THC really takes the edge off quickly. It's more of that immediate effect because it's, you know, it, it, there's the psychoactive component. So, you know, whether or not you're releasing the pain or you're just distracted, it helps. Um, if you're want to get on a CBD regime, 
the way to do that is probably through a product like ours where you're having this hemp derived CBD. There's very, very low percentage THC. You're not going to get high and you're just integrating the cannabinoid into your lifestyle so that like I spoke about with the CB1 and the CB2 receptors, you're balancing the endocannabinoid system over time and it can improve everything. Like it early research shows and suggests along with anecdotal evidence that it can improve a lot of symptoms of inflammation, you know, mood, et cetera. Where do you see, uh, where do you see uh, GHE going as far as like, are there ideas for different types of products or, or just, I guess yourself in general, like where do you see, uh, where do you see yourself with the whole cannabis industry going forward? Yeah, so we're, that's a great question. We're really committed to the idea of rest, recovery, rejuvenation. So helping people look and feel and perform their best. And we're interested in all sorts of ingredients that can help people accomplish that. Um, we have a lot of partners in spas and resorts and um, kind of these, these high-end places that target those sorts of customers. And so for them, we are developing other products that help in the beauty space and the self-care space, but we're also really interested in performance and recovery um, and more of the athletic data-driven component. So we have released a series of bullet journals, which is just, they're PDFs that you can use to track 30 days uh, recovery, mood, um, sleep, and you can play with adding in CBD and really quickly visualizing how it's impacting, you know, these big picture, these big picture goals. Um, and we like to explore how we can better help people navigate introducing CBD and these other types of supplements into their life and, and really evaluating how it works and in what patterns it works and watching how their physiology evolves. So we're interested in, in kind of all those different sides, but they all feed into GE's concept of optimal health through conscious living um, and being pioneers with some of these more interesting novel ingredients. Awesome. Well, Jennifer, it's been great having you on the show today. Um, if people want to find out more about uh, your work or GE, uh, where would you direct them to? Yeah, thank you. It's been so fun. Um, our website is ghi.com, J-I-H-I. And you can also send me an email, jen, J-E-N, at ghi.com. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear from your, from your listeners. And this has been so fun to connect with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. And if those listeners, if you guys did enjoy the show today, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. And you can also find audio versions of the podcast available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and just about anywhere else that audio podcasts are available. Jennifer, again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much.